Well, good afternoon. It is really a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Avert Network for helping me to get here just in time. And thank you to the bustling, bustling city of Melbourne. I can say that now because I live in Canberra. And thank you, Mark, for hosting this panel. It was great to meet you just earlier today in collaboration with six other colleagues and the Radicalization Awareness Network policy support team. I'm really quite excited to pr present some of the findings from our mixed method assessment of 15 different expert assessments that were looking at the practices, policies, and programs within the European Union that were focused toward, as they phrased it, online youth radicalization. I understand that term is quite contentious and for good reason. More than happy to discuss it in greater detail during question time. This research is really focused on individuals that are seven to 14 years of age, considered children, or adolescents, our aim was to understand the experiences and the evaluations of academics, practitioners, and policymakers who were knowledgeable in the European Union in the ways in which their policies or programs might be designed to better understand or mitigate the harms of online extremism. It's usually easy to start a presentation like this with a story, something that arose several times uh, during our conversations uh, with different practitioners. There were two 12-year-old children in Germany who were said to be groomed by online extremist recruiters who had openly displayed far-right symbols on their profiles while dwelling in the online gaming platform Roadblocks. The recruiters ushered the two children into an adjacent Discord chat room where they were further subjected to taunts and ideological messaging specifically presented with anti-Semitic jokes and neo-Nazi digital propaganda. This engagement with the recruiters punctuated the two children's various psychological and cultural hardships. They identified them as bullying within their school and family conflict. It was later believed that these hardships had significantly contributed to their indulging the recruiters and even bolstering a sense of camaraderie and personal significance. Exposed to this uncommon, and I would guess rather engaging circumstance, the children then established an emotional affinity, some kind of psychosocial dependency to the extent where they were worried and had reported after the fact that they could have jeopardized their bond with the recruiters, threatened their friendship, their sense of belonging. Diligently following the recruiters instructions, by traveling uh, to their school over the next day or so to offer a Hitler salute at their school and assault other students. Roadblocks is, of course, not the only space to worry about, and Europe is not the only context of concern. Even over the last year or so, and much closer to home, there were two separate incidents of teenage cases in Singapore. One 15-year-old boy who was engrossed in the so-called Islamic State propaganda and considering a knife attack, uh, beheading a non-Muslim person, while another 16-year-old consumed enough neo-Nazi online ideology and then sub subsequently and somewhat paradoxically then pledged themselves to the so-called Islamic State while playing online games. Since 2015, there have been more than 11 online self-radicalization Singaporean youth aged either 20 or below. This decreasing age in extremist communities, or perhaps I should say a decreasing age in online radicalization cases, continues to grow and appear intermittently both in and beyond the continent of Europe and greatly concerns us. In fact, it's that concern that I could bring you these findings today. In an evolving digital media landscape, there's an even greater need for more effective interventions and evidence-based approaches to recognize and reprimand the harms of early childhood and teenage exposure to such content. While recent attempts to better understand online youth radicalization has markedly increased and been specifically contextualized to different technologies, social media, online gaming, all the rest, I know you know, certain questions are said to remain unanswered, even contested. And this was something that came across quite saliently in the conversations that I had with practitioners. We were wondering while conducting each of these interviews, what each of our experts would say, what their assessments would be. 
they revolved a few very important questions. They're certainly not limited to these, but I think you'll get the gist. To what extent are children and teenagers routinely exposed to extremist content and where is of most concern? What are the developmental milestones that we should be aware of when considering the concept or phrase of online youth radicalization, given uh, that children and adolescents pass through these different milestones according to their unique and context-specific genetic, environmental, and individual differences? The core question there is, does radicalization as a concept bear any important value or discretion on youngsters when opposed to, say, someone who is middle-aged? What is the difference there in development that we should be paying closer attention to? Is radicalization even an adequate concept to try to capture these complex processes or developmental conditions that lead to the kind of behavior I know we are all concerned about? So why does online youth radicalization remain largely underrepresented as a research and policy subject among certain member states, but not others? And so this research really sought to understand from the experts' perspective, what are their answers to these questions? What are their conjectures? What are their suspicions? And can they identify the harms that might arise or emerge from children and adolescents becoming exposed systematically to extremist content? Are there any policies, practices, or programs that are currently present within Europe that can help us to better understand and address this? So this research involved three uh, separate methods, you might say, or this is the entire methodological process. It involved a multidisciplinary review, a semi-structured interviews, and a broader case study analysis. Again, we were charged with trying to encompass all 28 member states and then provide a concentrated assessment of just four case studies. The literature review, of course, encompassed both research and literature and policy initiatives. We drew on 15 uh, semi-structured interviews with experts between July 2023 and July this year. Interviewees were initially identified using the Radicalization Awareness Network participant database, a fantastic database for anyone interested in looking for participants abroad. We invited participants who, because of their expertise or their connection to or even previous consultancy on online youth radicalization. Fortunately, most of the people that we reached out to accepted our invitation and talked to us eagerly. The interviewees came from a range of different countries, both within and outside of Europe, Australia, Canada, UK, Sweden, Italy, Romania, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, Bulgaria, and Scandinavia, at least at the time of their recording. We wanted to, again, approach these interviews with as much care as we could. We took on a mixed methods approach, conducting an initial qualitative assessment, right? We used some reflexive thematic analysis, trying to identify overarching themes and organize them in a coherent manner. But we also wanted to try to get the macro statistical gist of what happened across all 15 of those conversations. The member states that we chose to do case studies on were Belgium, Spain, the Netherlands, and Sweden for reasons that I wish I had more time to get into, perhaps during our extended question time. So I should say uh, this study is still in press. However, I'm more than happy to share our preliminary findings. For some, it may seem awfully broad, but there are specifics here that are worth really narrowing in on. The psychological appeal of extremist content, especially misogynistic content, was repeated frequently throughout the conversations. This kind of content was particularly enticing. It was said for young boys who were drawn to this bored, I should say bold, uh, rebelliousness that was conveyed in a lot of the messaging that most concerned the interviewees. As young viewers encountered this messaging, often our experts would tell us stories about how a child or an adolescent would emulate the behaviors or attitudes of the figures that they thought they were embodying. Obviously, themes of male supremacy and anti-woman violence were often associated with and mentioned alongside 
influencers like Andrew Tate. Influencers within this space are skilled at exploiting social and psychological needs of young users, particularly for approval, belonging, and what was interesting, purpose. The sense that they were uh, suffering an extended period of a nome, a kind of aimlessness for which this content did well to sharpen their attention on something. While such influences may not openly advocate for extreme violence, it was thought to normalize, to mainstream, and certainly promote harmful beliefs as one interviewer referred to it, soft entry to violent extremism. One, gaming uh, was obviously another key area of concern with various interconnected chat features and multiplayer modes and all of the other interesting interactive features that some of us enjoy uh, were thought to leave some young users more susceptible to influence, especially when in games where social interactions are predicated on being productive in the game, slaying the dragon together, as one interviewee put it. Interviewees often pointed out that both strategic and intentional efforts to narrow cast were happening alongside more incidental and unwitting efforts or such organic exposure to extremist content. Both of these were thought to not just occur simultaneously, but converge in ways that made such gaming spaces more concerning than social media in some ways. The interviewees highlighted significant gaps in digital literacy among both parents and educators at the community level, at least those communities that our interviewees worked in. Many adults who played central role in guiding young people online lack the necessary skills in understanding or navigating those spaces Effectively, this was thought to leave especially children more vulnerable to the harms that extremist communities pose, essentially leaving a deficit in their capacity to navigate digital spaces safely. Interviewees often suggested implementing awareness programs specifically targeting parents and teachers by empowering them with knowledge about online dangers, about the programs that were available to them, establishing a network at the local level of informed adults. One of the most common uh, criticisms of this whole proposal was the inability to court uh, the attention of parents with this problem. At the continental level, a broader need for collaboration across various sectors was repeated Interviewees expressed a concern for the lack of interdisciplinary co cooperation, especially between neuropsychology, child developmental sciences, education, software engineers, and political science. Quite an appropriate mix considering the problem that we're all looking at. Moreover, there is a limited cooperation between technology companies, these developmental sciences, and violent extremist researchers. I'm sure some in this room would be happy to cooperate if such opportunities would present themselves. This lack of private and public collaboration was thought to make the most advantageous design choices, this safety by design school, far more difficult to adopt, to establish and to enforce, such as age appropriate online safety measures and restrictions. Without this cross-pollination of insight, protective measures, this sense that long-term substantive empirical research and policy experimentation would remain unlikely and fragmented. So now just an overview of the macro statistical findings that we had. Uh, this is a word frequency distribution graph encompassing all 15 interviewee transcripts. As you can see, there's a considerable interest with online gaming. Gaming frequently occurring, a seventh most uh, common uh, word in our entire corpus. There were references to demographics that were of more concern than others. For instance, children featured quite commonly 525, whereas adolescents featured far less at 43. We can understand why the concern might be concentrated on those demographics that are thought to be most susceptible to influence. Increasingly, radicalization was more so invoked as a predominant concept than extremism. I think the gist that both I and the rest of the research team got uh, was that radicalization was by far the greatest concern, assuming uh, that children wouldn't actually engage in extreme violence, but would be far more likely to take up the ideas necessary to do so. 
This is a text search uh, illustration. It might seem a little confusing to see. Essentially, you're looking uh, for online gaming where it's placed in specific sentences, and it shows conceptual and linguistic clustering or associations. It's there to try to illustrate what ways online gaming was talked about and I can give you a little bit more detail on the references that were made there. So as highlighted, uh, online gaming was really contentious among the interviewees that we spoke to. There was a very clear divide between techno-optimists and doomers, people who really thought it was a place for a positive social engagement, whereas others more or less looked past any positive uh, implications of becoming involved in some online gaming community and has said that it was essentially, quote unquote, breeding ground for grooming in a very vast space that can't be monitored or regulated and all the things that we don't like to hear. Of course, we all uh, thought coming away from those conversations that it seems like both things can be true at the same time. We wanted to find out in what ways did the concern about a lack of interdisciplinary research between the neurodevelopmental sciences and violent extremism. So we wanted to see where terms like brain and psychology and development were placed in these conversations over time. Here, brain really sat at the core of some of the discussions related to maturation, to development, to cognitive processing. For instance, interviewees often evoked a certain perspectives which make assessments like evolutionary perspectives of the delayed maturation of the teenage brain, a significant detail to take into account when conducting any future research on online youth radicalization, especially under the age of 14. Phrases like matured, you know, you're less vulnerable, make direct references to this relationship between cognitive maturity and the capacity to avoid a recruiter tactics or even have a general critical attitude toward the digital media that a child or adolescent would be exposed to. Interviewees often acknowledge the broad and imprecise frameworks that we currently have to assess this cognitive, psychological or developmental milestones that might be most important for future research. Now, these were some of the policy recommendations that were offered uh, to us by our interviewees. Individual member states, of course, have invested a considerable amount of resources to try to understand this problem and develop different approaches and programs, but it's not a united front. And a lot of the efforts that have been made are often addressing the problem indirectly, such as developing enhanced digital media or digital media literacy pro programs, promoting democratic values, and conducting and deploying counter narratives. All of this is very important, but it must be said it is indirect. And of course, uh, across uh, Europe, specific issues connecting radicalization with vulnerable populations do remain essential priorities. Two priorities that occurred frequently throughout the conversation were unsupervised exposure to misogynistic or jihadist content and offline experiences of ethnic discrimination or socioeconomic disadvantage, especially among child returnees. In saying all this, uh, our interviews were adamant uh, that these recommendations ought to be further resourced or at least met in conversations with some of their colleagues across the continent. There are skills-based education, so recommending that youngsters understand better what their options are when coming in contact with different digital media. How can they contextualize their exposure to this digital media, such, such as understanding, can I trust this? Is this something that I ought to take into account? In what ways could this benefit or harm me? These kinds of questions. One that was very interesting and only arose a couple times, but with a sort of quite an impact on, on the project was this sense that we could be providing more self-awareness and tools and self-regulation. I know it might sound a little odd, but learning how to monitor and adjust uh, one's internal life may provide greater resilience, especially when children and adolescents are navigating these spaces alone. Online gaming environments were raised as a highly emotional space and that can leave children and adolescents very vulnerable to manipulation, introducing such self-regulation techniques 
cognitive behavioral strategies or even meditation can help young, youngsters to maintain kind of emotional stability where they are really competing in these spaces and cooperating with other people and leaving themselves open to this de-identification or as um, Rachel puts it, identity fusion. Again, as I mentioned, this broader uh, psychosocial and biological development is something that ought to be more central in future attempts to understand the vulnerabilities of children and adolescents at this age to certain types of content. As one interviewee put it, whatever relevant neurodevelopmental research may be available, the policymakers that I work with don't know it. And unfortunately, this is not taken into account despite the assumptions around the development of children and adolescents when making assessments of online radicalization, a pretty important topic. And I've just been flashed uh, the finish card and I realize that I've been having way too much fun up here. So I do want to just quickly state three recommendations for you that we offered. One was to establish an interdisciplinary evidence base to commit to more long-term funding schemes and to provide those provisions both for psychosocial and socioeconomic training for children and adolescents to foster the kind of resilience that we know that we need. And I do need to pause in order to give a moment of gratitude to the remainder of the researchers on this team. I wouldn't usually show photos of the researchers, but Lorraine is fantastic in designing these slides. And as you can see, certainly more optimistic about technology than I am. And we were received a really an immense amount of support from the RAND policy support team. Thank you so much for listening. I'd, like, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Tony Stanley and Carol Pitson from Oranga Oriki, who will give their presentation on statutory social work for radicalizing and extremist groups and emerging practice issue for after So if you Tony and Carol. Anami Nui Koto Katoa. I'm just organizing my screen. Do be with me. Uh, I'm wondering if you can see the slides on the screen. I think you can see the slides, yeah. Um, nami no Koto Katoa. Uh, I will start with a traditional way we greet and welcome each other here from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We'll introduce ourselves and then I'll set the scene for the paper. We'll go through some ideas and looking forward to that question time. So on that note, Inoi tato, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Ki a mā, ki na kina ki uta, ki a mā tada tada ki taia. Hi aki ana, te ata kura, he tio, he hoka, he hoku, te hei mauri ora. So kia ora folks, Tony Stanley is my name. I'm the National Practice Designer for Oranga Tamariki, our statutory child protection youth justice service. I'll invite my colleague Carol to introduce herself. Kia ora. Kia ora, thank you, Tony. Uh, kia ora koutou, everybody. Ko Carol Kitson tuka ingoa. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Carol Kitson, and I'm the project lead for our Oranga Tamariki Agency's response in this field. Tony. Kia ora, Carol. So I opened up with a traditional kara kia, folks, as we work in this uh, in the space in our Aotearoa. The, the translation of that kara kia really is around um, uh, ceasing the winds, ceasing the harsh winds from the south and the west, bringing together the flow of warmer winds across the seas and welcoming us together in a space to do the work together. Um, awesome that we can be here with you from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Sorry we can't be there, uh, Atinana, in person with you. Um, we've got some uh, slides to share, and I'm just now curious, can you see the slides on the screen? Yes. Yeah, you can. Great, great. Thanks, folks. That's brilliant. So, look, what we want to do today is really also acknowledge our colleague Steve Barakosa from New South Wales, from the Department of Corrections there and Justice. Um, we have a trans-Tasman piece of work going on, and we want to acknowledge Steve's work. There's a recent pa paper published outlining our contributions in this field, and we want to really bring a practical sense of how we work with these issues here in Aotearoa, with a particular focus on youth and children, and we're calling this an emerging practice issue. Um, uh, and we're gonna go through our policy landscape because that's an important area of work. 
And we're going to make some significant contributions, we hope, around the place of family and what we would say fun from our Indigenous people here and their important contribution, not only to this issue of practice, but to our offer of practice more generally from Oranga Tamariki. And we're going to show you how we work with these cases, small though they are for us, small in numbers, but significant as you'll be uh, working together there in, uh, in the symposium. So on that note, I'll just pass over to Carol, who will take us through the policy landscape for Aotearoa, and then we'll move back into those practice um, implications and orientations, indeed how we work with these matters as they arise. Kia ora, Carol. Thank you, Tony. So we move to the... Yeah, oh, we'll the slides that. on. Thank you for that. So yeah, um, we thought it would be useful that uh, we explain a little bit about the policy, the legislation and the strategy that governs New Zealand's uh, response to these issues of violent extremism and radicalisation to start with. Um, and I want to lead off around uh, reminding people, I suppose, that on March the 15th in 2019 in Christchurch, New Zealand suffered its worst terrorist attack ever. 50 people were killed and approximately 50 were severely injured, injured, some with ongoing and life-changing injuries. So a Royal Commission of Inquiry report was actioned and it identified the need for New Zealand to develop a strategy of prevention to avoid such future attacks. He Aranga Aki Oha, as I'll refer to it, because He Aranga Aki is a bit long and I'll carry on. Uh, so Ha I'll refer to as ha ana, He Aranga Aki. So this was developed out of this need. So HA is a multi-agency disengagement framework and a deliverable of New Zealand's national strategy for countering terrorism and violent extremism work program. HA was launched on the 13th of December in 2022. The name here, Aranga Aki, means to arise, to emerge, to make seen. The New Zealand Police lead the delivery of HAAR's work and they coordinate the response from the seven participating government agencies, being Oranga Tamariki, the Ministry of Social Development, Ministries of Education, Corrections and Health, the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service and uh, New Zealand Police. He Aranga's, he Aranga Aki's purpose is the, present, is the prevention of acts of violent extremism or terrorism through the engagement and provision of coordinated support and interventions to at-risk individuals to enhance protective factors and, and or minimise those identified risk factors. The HAAR framework has been built on decades of learning which we've obtained through agencies working together around youth and adults on a case-by-case -case basis. It is nationally coordinated and is further enabled by localised delivery um, disengagement plans are individualised to that person of concern. At an individual level, the focus is on building resilience and self-confidence uh, while building protective factors against an individual's radicalisation. At an environmental level, the focus moves to building the level of engagement, connectedness and commitment the person has towards mainstream society and the degree of social support such as access to resources and opportunities uh, that the individual experiences. So our partner agencies work collaboratively and proactively together for as long as is required to deliver the best outcome for that person of concern. The framework incorporates a New Zealand designed assessment which provides an understanding of risk and threat and additionally places a substantial focus on addressing the protective factors. Thanks, Tony. Te Aranga Oki operates in the prevention spectrum of New Zealand's countering violent extremism strategy. So this is a holistic strategy that involves all New Zealanders, including communities, our media, the government and our technology platforms. The hierarchical structure of HA pre presents a governance group where senior leaders of each of those seven agencies sit. And this group reports upwards to the New Zealand Countering Terrorism Coordination Committee. Uh, the National Coordination Group, or NCG, so this is our operational hub of the HA response. Senior members of each agency sit at this table and they coordinate the resources required from each agency, again on a case-by-case -case basis. They remove any barriers if required and they help build knowledge and capability 
for those people that are asked to work in this area. Then we have our regional intervention team. So this is our local response. And this consists of only those agencies who need to provide support on the ground. The regional intervention teams ultimately own the plan and are empowered to deliver it. So they use their local knowledge of community support and any of the agencies um, that are contracted for services at that local level. So the referral mechanism, referrals are discretionary by HAR agencies. Any HAR agency can refer a person for consideration. HAR is not ideology specific as it's intended to be agile, recognizing that ideologies may be mixed, unclear or changing. So when assessing a potential person, um, a decision will be based on the presence of sufficient observable behaviors or indicators, we call those, that suggest someone may be on a pathway towards carrying out or facilitating an act of extremist violence. Agencies consider also whether the person is considered to have the potential to benefit from inclusion on HAR. So that's another criteria. Where the person presents an imminent threat of harm, they will not be considered suitable for acceptance until such time as an investigation or any other interventions have occurred, then they are no longer considered a serious threat. HAR is designed to be a continuous learning model, able to provide high level information around vulnerabilities being identified to inform conversations with those most likely to be impacted and to also inform the wider system response outside of HAR. Operationally, HAR is compliant with all uh, relevant legislative and regulatory frameworks. It delivers a human rights-based approach that is in alignment with the United Nations Rights of the Child, or UNCROC. And finally, as a um, intro into Tony's uh, discussion, I'd like to offer a very generalized view of the cases our agencies have dealt with so far. Um, so they are predominantly male, aged between 11 to 17 years. They are exploring their identity. They have experienced bullying at school. Home life is not always ideal. They have the necessary tech skills to operate uh, online. There is a presence of neurodiversity issues and there is a mix of ideology. And our ongoing challenge is that there are sometimes missed opportunities for prevention. So kia ora, folks, and uh, Tony, I'd like to hand over to you. Kia ora, Carol. Thanks for that backdrop. So, folks, how do we then create uh, confident capacity to respond to this emerging issue from a practice perspective? We need to talk about risk because... We are in the business as a statutory child protection youth justice agency to respond to children and young people when they are indeed at risk, as Carol indicated. When a young person aged up to 18 is in need of care and protection or statutory services, we distinguish youth justice responses for those children 14 and over. Now, as Jay just referenced in the earlier presentation that we know from Steve's research in New South Wales and here in Aotearoa, as Carol mentioned, our age of people coming to our attention is decreasing. As Carol said, 11-year-olds and so forth are uh, in our purview here. So we have, as a statutory social work service, moved from a situation where risk was our dominant frame for all matters. Now, we learned from the English experience when the prevent agenda in England, the issue of child protection services, police services, security services, information flow, case management, sharing, and so forth, was of a rather liberal nature. We're very clear here in Aotearoa, from an ethical position, social work is our discipline inside our statutory child welfare service. That means that we need to be very clear about our role and contribution, that we need to understand how we consider the notion of risk from an indigenous perspective where risk is considered in the context of family connection. Now that for us, that's a, an imperative from our fertility responsibilities. It's also in line, as Carol said, with our UNCOC obligations. So our risk work in Aotearoa here is ecological, it's contextual. And that work for us in all of our child protection youth justice means that when we're responding to young people engaged in or heading toward or coming from a referral from the HAAR program, our social workers, they're in the best position to understand the child in a context within which harm or likely harm can occur that the family and whānau are absolutely key to us in our work of intervening, 
that our families are indeed our, one of our lead professionals, as we'd say, because we want to ensure that our police services, our intelligence services, undertake their jurisdiction responsibilities, but that our social work and our statutory service also undertakes its responsibility. And so we collaborate, but we're not co-opted, as was the experience in England and local authorities when information flow occurred rather liberally and we take a strong ethical stance to the protection of information and share, as Carol said, through the framework of the uh, of the program. So how do we do this? How do we help our social workers? I'm delighted that Aotearoa has a social work discipline and a social work cadre of workers in our statutory services. How do we help them work with this issue? Highly emotional, highly anxious. There's a lot of people looking, a lot of attention to this area, as is rightly so. But how do we ensure our social workers are the lead professional stepping forward confidently? And the way we do that is through this. We've developed a practice framework for all of our practice orientations inside our service. And we want to show you how we're applying this in these particular cases. These particular cases require intensive case management sometimes daily with meetings between agencies, family and so forth to keep a real tight grip on what we're thinking and worried about and how we're working. I mentioned this issue that the work is highly emotional. How do we support and hold our people so they stay with this, with this matter in these cases? And how do we lead when it's young people and children involved? How do we step forward confidently when the amount of interagency people at those tables can be overwhelming with police and security services? So our practice framework, I want to explain rather briefly, and again, in the paper that we can help send out through the facilitators here at the event symposium, explain this in more detail. It's a five domain practice framework that calls out the heart of our work starts from a position of rights and values and our obligations. That means that every social worker that's registered is held to a higher account, that our rights positioning, as Carol referenced, is embedded from the United Nations rights of the child to indigeneity and disability. We move up through the framework to the top left of Fai Maturanga, our knowledge base. What do we need to understand for each of the matters we're working with? What's the knowledge already available to me from police, from security and so forth that's appropriate for me to know? Remember, we don't have all of the information and nor should we from those intelligence services. But I do need to know as a social worker, the issues of online gaming, of access, of, of, of what happens in the family system after hours when, when lads are in the sleep out and so forth. I need to understand the family culture and mores that might be, um, uh, as, as Jade said in the earlier presentation, uh, adult family members not as aware as the online world as we need to be. We need to understand the research available to us to think through this issue. And that then leads us to across the framework to our response orientation. How will I bring about change? Remember, I've started warmly with engaging. I'm understanding the situation to assess from a social work perspective. What am I using to bring about change? We have here proudly in Aotearoa, the Family Group Conference, internationally regarded as a change model inside social work, bringing family and community together to share the information and to empower family and whanau to come up with plans of interruption and making sure again, the message is family at the table, early, always included, and that kind of work. We have particular models for our Māori, young people and families, and our Pacifica as well. Moving down the framework then, what are the skills and tools available to me as a social worker that I need to understand and work with? What are the safety tools that I can draw on to bring about a safety plan today? Our leaving of the home for children is our last resort. What can I do as a practitioner to bring around enough safety right now, whether it be restriction on online and so forth? How can the family support us at three in the morning, deliver on that? The bottom part of the framework is a really important part in, in our work. This is about support, guidance, and challenge for our social workers. How do I encourage a culture of reflexivity? What do I, the social worker, think about kids online and gaming? What do I understand about the risk and harm that could occur by connecting through international networks? What's my response to that? How does that help my work? How might it get in the way of my work? What's my supervision and coaching around me? And in a sense, the framework is quite simple because we are all using it to guide 
our practice responses to this issue and indeed all child welfare youth justice matters. So there are four principles here and most organisations, I'm sure your organisations, will have a version of a framework to guide and support practice. In the delivery of important policy initiatives, this is important. So here's what we say are the uh, criteria really for a good practice framework. It has to set out and explain our practice approach. It has to guide our people in the use of supervision models, tools and resources. It's got to support us to apply change modalities. It's, 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 it's absolutely right. We understand the situation as best we can, but we are in the business of bringing about change to improve the situation away from pathways of offending toward a more improved, and we would say and argue, a better state of order, that well-being idea that's fit for all of our people. And lastly, a practice framework needs to reinforce good and improving social work. It has to encourage reflexivity. I made the point earlier and Jade referenced this in his earlier presentation, these cases are highly emotional. They're really anxious and, and bring up stuff. I've been in support hui with our social workers, but we have numbers of key professionals there from security services, police and senior managers. Our social worker needs to be the most important person in the room. So the frame has got to give them the ability to articulate what they're drawing on, how they're understanding the situation, the models and tools for change, and that intensive case management to bring assurance that we are supporting the situation away from offending into a better situation. So here's, here's a, a very simple composite case study for us. And again, I think we Jade alluded to these sorts of illustrations, a young, young Pākehā lad, a, a young uh, yeah, lad online at night, 13, connected and via gaming to kids overseas, sharing of images, incitements to act, um, and in, in situations where other jurisdictions raid homes, our people are involved because of that online connectivity. So how does the framework then help me as the social worker begin to plan my work? This is what we call organizing my practice. It's a recent resource uh, issued to our staff. We're helping them use it. And it simply is highlighting how the practice framework guides me, orientates me. And when I'm feeling overwhelmed or anxious or need to report on my practice, I use this to articulate my current state of understanding what I'm drawing on and how I am orientating the system, the family and child to move away from harm into an improved situation. Starting off again from the heart of our practice, what are the principles and values here I need to uphold? What's the right thing to do? Naming that clearly leads into what are the areas of knowledge and understanding I need to draw on? What do mum and dad, auntie, grandmother, what's their views about this matter? Uh, how can I help mobilize them into being uh, facilitators of change and interruption? Um, situations where we have extended family care, older relatives caring for our young people who may be uh, less aware. A young person is, is outside in the sleep out, calm it would seem. What are they doing out there? How do we monitor and help, interrupt, intervene, and so forth in a family-focused way? Again, moving around the framework, family group conferencing, bringing people together, looking at models of change, and having a methodology to support practitioners is important in the offsetting of over-anxious practice and over-interventionist practice, and then down to the skills, and again, round, just naming what is this like for me as a worker? What is it bringing up for me? What might I need to bring to supervision as a way to understand my responses to this work, given it's high anxiety, high emotion, and really high stakes in terms of where we are as a country? So we're calling this an emerging area of practice. Um, uh, the, the recent paper named, named that for us because we want this to be a social work response that is not highly sexed up, that is not flagpoles flying, that are not bells ringing and so forth, alarms going off. We want to promote this in everyday practice terms. We are good at child welfare and youth justice responses. This is an issue of young people with some additionality. As, as Carol said, with the neurodiversity issues, with our understanding of, of young people and their behaviors and their family systems, we're saying this is a practice response 
with some additional things to consider and understand using the framework to make sense of that. So we work with our security people. We work with our police. Of course we do. But unlike England, we are not sequestered as part of that security service. We stand alone but work cooperatively, but not in a sequestered way. For Aotearoa at the moment, this is a watching brief. Cases are low in numbers, rare, but they are high stakes and they do require a high amount of resourcing. And given, as Carol said, the backdrop for our own context here, this is an area we need to be leading strongly and confidently in. So we've produced practice guidance that's available to you to review on our practice center. We have tools like knowing the signs, uh, early intervention, helpful clues that uh, our education colleagues and health colleagues can use in their work. And to sum up the place of the practice framework then, we do want to understand, assess situations from a social work perspective. We want to intervene helpfully and guide people away from toward a better improved oranga situation. But we want to have an ethical basis to this work. As I said, not opening up our books for others to see and understand our clear social work commitment to our ethical stance that we have a skill base here. Social workers are incredibly good at intensive case management. They're incredibly good at family whānau focus, bringing people together. And we wanna have a more risk sophisticated approach, not a risk elimination, which can lead to removal of children in rather hurried ways. We wanna promote practice models and tools. The Good Lives uh, model is one where we're working with now in certain situations. A family group conference, signs of safety, these are all evidence-informed ways of working to shift the situation along. And from a social perspective, that's key to our work. And then rounding off, of course, reflexivity. We want to promote a practice culture here where those assigned these cases are supported and enabled to be emotional about the work, to understand the anxiety that operates and circulates around these matters, to feel supported and to know where they're going by using the practice framework to lay out what they're drawing on, how they know what they know, what it means and what we need to do next. And on that note, I'll just pause and I'll pass back to Carol who will, who will round us off in the usual way. Kia ora, Carol. Uh, kia ora, Tony, I think we have got... Um... We're on time. Thank goodness for that. Um, look, <laughs> I, before we before we close, um, I'd just like to thank Avert um, from from our, both ourselves um, for the opportunity to present. Um, it's yeah, we have wanted to get there in person. Uh, we see we saw that as a key opportunity to. Um, to integrate and network with everybody, um, but hopefully the next time round we will have, um, get get to do that. Um, and want to thank yourselves and the in the audience, the wider international community, for sharing your learnings. Um, and a, a lot of them we're not going to be able to see until everyone's gone home. However, I want to acknowledge that um, yeah, in any any um, communication afterwards. Um, is going to be welcome to either um, Tony or myself or even Steve Barakosa. Um, also want to acknowledge our He Aranga Aki um, framework back in New Zealand for supporting our Oranga Tamariki work um, and, of course, allowing us the opportunity to present to you and engage with you uh, into the future. We also want to acknowledge the young people throughout the world who are growing up in a time of unprecedented change. Um, our work is so important and a legacy, we, you know, feel the need to leave a legacy for generations to come that's protective and preventative. So to close our presentation today, we, as we started, we'll close with a karakia or prayer. And um, this prayer goes, uh, Unuhia, 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 ki te uru tapu nui, kia wātia, kia māma, te nāko, te tinana, te wairua, e te aratangata, koia rā e rongo, Whakairie ake ki runga, ki a tina, tina, huie, tai ki e. Tai ki e. The, and the meaning behind that one also is draw on, draw on, draw on the sacredness, declare to the free, the heart, the body, the spirit of mankind. Kia ora and thank you. Thank you very much.